Chris. <laughs> A-Hole Productions. Resident Evil. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my commentary track for Resident Evil, the final chapter. Probably the one of the worst movies that has ever existed. Uh, I am not going to be very nice in this <laughs> commentary, but I will point out stuff that is like from the games and everything like that. And I'll also want to, uh, you know, point out the stories, the tragic stories that happened to Olivia Jackson, uh, Ricardo, um, who was also a stunt person, Ricardo Cornelius. And there was another person, I think they were unnamed, that got like uh, tore a ligament in their shoulder. But these are three stunt people that, uh, two of which were injured in this movie, one uh, Olivia Jackson lost her arm uh, during the filming of this movie as a stunt person, and Ricardo Cornelius, who who died, he got crushed to death because of this movie. Um, because this movie, in my opinion, was made by unprofessionals. Uh, this franchise, just the last two movies, Resident Evil Retribution and this one, had a total of 15 injured people. Uh, in the fifth movie, uh, Retribution, which we talked about already and did a commentary for, that one, uh, there was like a group of people as zombies and they were on a bridge and the bridge collapsed and it injured all 12 of them. Um, I understand accidents happen. Obviously, there's tragedies that happen on movie sets from time to time. But for one franchise in the span of two movies to have this many uh, just shows the lack of preparedness that some of these stunt teams have um, and the uh, lack of care that goes into these films. And so when people say, hey, I think you're a little hard on these movies, uh, no, I don't think so. Because someone's dead because of this movie we're about to watch. And uh, and someone lost their arm and another person tore ligaments on their arm. So, you know, that's too high of a price for something, like for any movie really. But especially for one as shitty as this one. So we're going to dive into it. So I'll sit here, I'll do a countdown. We'll do a you know, three, two, one, and then I'll tell you to hit play. So if you have the movie up, I'm so glad to finally be done with these. Uh, I've been dreading this one. That's why I keep putting it off because uh, I, I don't like this movie at all. I mean, like the other ones have some good in them and, and maybe more good in them uh, than this one for sure. This is just all bad. From a writing standpoint, it's awful. From an acting standpoint, it's awful. Obviously, the stunt team, uh, parts of the, the second unit and the people that were working on these that where these injuries and deaths happened, that's terrible. Um the directing is terrible. Uh, the the inclusion of what types of monsters they wanted to use, like ev nothing to me is there's nothing good about this movie. Um, but to Olivia and Ricardo and their family and loved ones, and to the third unnamed person who was injured, like I'm sorry. Like uh, as as a fan, I always hope for cool Res Evil movies, and I want you know you know great action and great stuff. And you're all very talented and, and top notch stunt people. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry that this happened to you. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry to Ricardo's family. I'm sorry to Olivia's. Um, I'm glad she stood up against this and sued and, uh, you know, and, and fought because her life was changed. I hope Ricardo's family were in a position to where they could, you know, fight as well. And uh, it's just, it sucks. So I wanted to get that stuff out of the way before we get into this. So that being said, and now you know my feelings towards this uh, movie and franchise and some of the people who make it nothing negative I say afterwards should should surprise you, hopefully. Um, so without further ado, let's do this. Three, two, one, play movie. This movie sucks so bad, came and start on time. There it is. So we're now at the zero, zero second marker and the Sony logo just came up. So if you're watching along now, now that's where we can start. And we're about to get uh, some terrible score music which uh half of these movies have the first movie had a pretty decent uh, score and soundtrack the second movie the same thing actually i'm critical of the second movie but i thought it had a pretty decent score and soundtrack uh the third movie is when they started going into more of the just the scores and not really a soundtrack with bands and stuff uh, that was more of something they did with the first two movies uh, I think in the fourth movie, though, they used a, a Perfect Circle remix song, the Ren Holder remix of the Outsider song. Um, for this one, they kind of went back to that, like, industrial score music that they try to do in previous movies. And uh, it, does, it certainly, you know, 
normal because these movies have those, so it, it fits in with the aesthetic of the movies have had previously. But now we have this new movie, and it's uh, just on its own. Like, the music is didn't blow me away in this one. Um, some of the other movies, though, had pretty decent... Like, a, like one or two songs would be by the composers would be pretty good. So here we have another freaking intro that just has to be done every time with these movies. And this time, though, we're getting a completely new origin. So this little girl is Miljovic's real-life daughter. And then she, I think she also recently played young Black Widow in the Black Widow movie. But this intro we're getting with James Marcus and the voiceover, you don't need the voiceover. Like, that's what these movies always do. They're like, we need someone to just explain to you the visuals. And it's like, well, if you were a good writer and director, Paul W. Sanderson, you could have just had this happen and have an emotional opening to your movie. Um, and it would have caught people off guard. But this T-virus opening of, like, James Marcus was trying to use the T-virus to save his daughter, it's like, but you already told that story in the second movie, but it was Dr. Ashford. So like I said, this is not a bad intro if you don't think of the other movies. <laughs> but because they already did this before, it's just it rinse and repeat. It's like he it's literally like Paul W. Sanderson took his script for the second movie or something and just, you know, tweaked it a bit. And this is apparently how the T virus out like you know, outbreak began, or they did a test to see how it would work. And so they infected people, including kids, on this uh, this lift here. And of course, the kid transforms in seconds, which has never been a thing with the T-virus. Like, it's usually a slow process. So, I don't know. Like, this, <laughs> this uh, there's no consistency or continuity or anything in these movies. Uh, they're, they're just awful. And whatever Paul Anderson thinks would work, he does it. And the worst part is, is like, that scene, the way it's edited and the way the camera moves around, it's like, you know, it's like, does that uh, saw trick thing uh, where the camera rotates around somebody and they, they just take out every other frame or something to make it look more jumpy. Um, it's terrible. Like, it, it's so terrible. It doesn't add any fear. It, it It's so bad. So the editor on this movie, I will say, you are one of the worst editors in films. Um, I don't know whose idea it was. Like, I don't know, maybe you're decent and some executive told you to do the stuff you do in this movie, which that's possible. But so I'm willing to give you the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> but these movies, this movie is edited so poorly. Things just cut and move like uh, too quickly. I mean, like literally here, dad just died there. She didn't even come down the stairs. Um, and I don't know, whatever. So if you haven't realized this, we're like, what, four minutes in, three and a half minutes in, we're still listening to this opening. Um, and they're bringing back characters like this guy, like uh, Dr. Isaacs, who is made up for the movie universe. He's, he's, he doesn't exist in the video games. Um, but apparently he's been behind this the whole time. And he makes Dr. Isaac clones to live on the surface after the T-virus broke out. And uh, and then now we get this, like, you know, the, the T-virus escape. We get the recap now. So first first we get a retcon new origin. And now we have this, which is uh, this terrible um, recap. And you see clips from all these, like, just terrible movies, in my opinion. Yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm pretty negative. I know there are people that are fans of this. And, you know, you obviously you do not have to sit here and listen to me bitch about this movie. But, I mean, when I see the trailer for the new movie, the, the reason why I don't get upset the way other people are upset over stupid things like the, the, the race of a character or something, it's like, oh, Jill, why is Jill black? Like, that doesn't make any sense. And it's like the reason I don't get mad about that stuff is because we have these six movies and these six movies are terrible, especially this one. We're living, you know, picking right up where the last one left off. It ends with a big battle in Washington, D.C. at the White House. And then we don't even get to see that battle. It's just, oh, look, everything's done. And and uh, and now Alice, who was on the roof, is now just going to crawl out of the ground where we don't know where she was. 
We don't know who else was down there. Um, the, you know, Wesker was with her. Uh, he gave her her powers back. Uh, <laughs> but why, if he was just going to double cross her? Like, the Ada and Leon, like, we don't know anything about them. Uh, Chris, or no, I guess Chris, we don't know what happened to him after the fourth movie, so... Kmart, even Angie, like there's, there's, <laughs> there's so many characters in this franchise just forgot. And they try to get some of them back. I think for this movie, I think the original plan was to have Leon back and Ada and everybody, but I don't know if there was scheduling issues or whatever. Um, but for whatever reason, they couldn't get people back to, you know, conclude a story. And th that would have been crazy. Cause this would have been the first movie to have like Jill, Claire, Leon, and everybody in it in one movie. And that's even if this movie sucked, I think people would have remembered that. Um, by the way, drinking that water, why would you do that? Um, even if you were super thirsty, it's got to have T virus and G virus and everything else in it and human remains. Um, look at the editing there. Look how bad it is. Like this, this creature jumps out of the water and it's just like, you know, the, it keeps jump cutting instantly. Instead of just showing it like reaching for her and whimpering, you know, maybe you see it like, you know, its eyes are watery. It's like trying to eat. It's starving. It was at the bottom of that water. Like you could add real horror and terror and elements like that to these movies, but they don't like they, they, they cut out any tension or anything when you jump cut like that and you edit like that. Um, and so, yeah, so we get this like three four or five minute opening where she talks incessantly. Um, and then now we get, you know, a few minutes of no one talking <laughs> and you're just like, why couldn't you, I don't know. Why couldn't you have the opening just have introduce us to James Marcus and who is definitely a different version than the video game. James Marcus in the video game was a uh, hated umbrella and, uh, and wanted to get his revenge on them. And here in this movie universe, he's, as we're going to find out, He's Mila Jovovich's character, Alice's father. So we don't know who the mother is, it seems. But she's a, a clone of the original little girl that we saw in the intro. Um, this creature is not from the game, I don't think. It, it kind of a little bit looks like a creature from Resident Evil 5. Um, a little bit. Because it, it had the way its tail is like hanging down like that. There was a creature in Resident Evil 5 that was like a, a giant millipede, like mixed with a bat or something. Um, so this is a little bit like that. Um, but I believe, I don't know if this is the scene or if it's another scene where uh, Olivia, the stunt person, was injured. Uh, there was a scene where the, someone in a Jeep like this is supposed to be driving right at a camera. And what happened is they, the camera didn't... Uh, didn't you know, I guess, I don't know. Um, and I think this was the scene where Olivia or, you know, uh, maybe this is the scene, I don't know, but the scene where Olivia got injured was a scene involving a, a vehicle like this where it had to drive right at a camera and apparently they rehearsed it like they were supposed to rehearse it a couple different times. They did it one way and they decided they didn't want to do it that way anymore. So they changed it up last second, which is very unsafe to do. But they said, no, don't worry, we'll figure it out. When you drive towards the camera, the camera will move. Well, the camera didn't move. And so she drove right into the camera, I believe, is how she ended up getting injured to the point where they had to take her arm afterwards because it was because of the damage that was done. So, um... So this BSAA Jeep, which means nothing to anyone who's not a fan of the games, <laughs> because uh, in the games, uh, they had the BSAA is what Chris works for, but they never even introduced them into the movies. So we, so BSAA on the side of the Jeep is, is, it doesn't make any sense for it. But I think this might be one of the, it's either this scene or a scene like it, where the Jeep had to drive towards the camera. So that'll be, that's. That's why I brought up the Olivia story again, because it was something like this. I don't know if it was this exact scene, but it was it was a scene like this in the movie. Um, but like, there's no real tension here. Like, I'm not afraid for Alice. 
the last movie ended with her getting her superpowers back and she's still flipping around, like doing all kind of crazy stuff that a normal human couldn't. Um, I don't know, man, there's, she, this is just not a character. I see people get mad all the time, like with what they think is, you know, important to characters. And I'm like, why don't you, then why don't you get mad about Alice? <laughs> like she, like, I know there are people out there that do, but there's no character here. And they try to, after six movies now, they're trying to cram a bunch of character into her, but it's not going to work. Like it doesn't work. They, they try to be like, oh, she's, she's the little girl that you meet in the intro of this movie. It's like, yeah, but we literally, after six movies, we're just meeting that little girl and James Marcus. If you wanted that to have any emotional weight, you would have come with that, come up with that earlier, you know, and planned it out. Um, I think it was pretty clear after the first three Resident Evil movies, because Paul Anderson, I think said like, I was, I'm going to, well, we're done at three, but once they got a fourth one, they pretty much knew they were going to try to do another trilogy, or at least that was their plan. Um, and normally I don't like when people plan things and then it go wrong and they never finish their stories. But with this, like these movies are pretty low budget for what they are. They're like $60 million for the budgets, which is you know, not bad, honestly, that's a, that's a high budget for a Resident Evil movie. That's for sure. Um, but to me, they spend it on all the wrong things. They do all these dumb stunts that get people injured and killed when it's like, dude, just make a cool looking monster, uh, have a cool looking set, make the Spencer mansion. That's all the things the new movie's doing. The new movie has a similar budget to this movie, maybe a little bit less. And yet to me, they spent all the money in the right areas. And they got actors that are actually playing characters, it looks like. And, the, and they're trying to do an ensemble cast where multiple people have arcs that they go on throughout the movie. So you can sit there and hate the casting of the new movie all you want, but it sounds like they're trying to make a movie with characters. That is the opposite of what this is. This is not someone trying to make a movie. <laughs> like this is someone who uh, they've made already a, a, a half a dozen of these movies um, and they just want to hang out with their friends and loved ones. And, and, uh, and it has like a quote unquote family vibe where they're like, Oh, well, we bring characters back. Like Michelle Rodriguez in the last movie made no sense to bring her back. We're going to do it anyway. Carlos made no sense, but they brought him back anyway. Uh, this movie, Dr. Isaacs made no sense. But since, you know, the actor grew in popularity since game of Thrones, they thought, Hey, maybe we'll bring in a game of Thrones audience. And I think this movie did overall over, you know, overall do pretty well, um, financially, it didn't do great, you know, like there's definitely a decline in profit each movie made for the most part, but these movies do pretty well overseas. And I think that's why I, I hate them on some level, <laughs> not because they're, they do well overseas. That's, that's fine. But I think it's because the, the reason they're not written well, the reason they don't put any effort into any actual characterization or anything is because they don't want anything lost in translation when it releases overseas because they know that's mainly where they get their money from. Um, so that's why I think I have a problem with these movies is they use that as an excuse to be lazy. Uh, I think you can, you know, write a good story with compelling characters and call it Resident Evil. It does, it's not going to be an Oscar winner or anything, but you can at least do more and put more effort into characters and story and it still be well received, you know, overseas. Like people aren't dumb. Like they, they, you know, they'll have subtitles or it'll be, you know, translated in their language and it'll make sense to them to, to some degree. It'll make sense to them. Uh, so to, this is like a, a, a transformer approach where, you know, the last like two transformer movies or three of them, they were just kind of like, minus Bumblebee. Bumblebee, I felt like even though it ripped off ET, it tried to tell like a story with characters. But before that, they were just kind of like, eh, yeah, that doesn't characters don't matter we just need explosions and we need this and that translates well overseas and that will get us our money and that's why i i you know drives me nuts this franchise <laughs> that's why the transformer franchise drives me nuts too i have a love hate relationship with it so when people tell me they're a fan of this franchise and that they have like a they're like hey it's not great but it, it's not the worst thing i've ever seen I don't agree, but I, I understand that because I, I kind of like that with the Transformer movie sometimes. I'm like, well, Transformers to me doesn't need to be mind blowing because it's a, just based off a cartoon that was that, you know, tried to sell toys to kids. Um, but those cartoons still had some great character stuff in them. So I feel like the movie should still have that. Resident Evil, I think some of their characters in the games are blank slates. They kind of keep them empty and devoid of uh, arcs or emotions. So that way you, the a player can project yourself onto them and feel like you're there with them. 
Um, and that's in the early games until like, they started getting better with cutscenes and stuff. Then that changed and you got more involved with the characters. So to me, I think the movie should do that. And, and that's the problem. These movies went in the direction the video games went in where like Resident Evil 5 and 6, they were just like these dumb action things. And anytime they put something in there character wise, the dialogue was bad and it didn't make sense for the characters. And that's what these movies are. And that's what this one devolved into is like these these movies just get worse and worse after the first one. Like the first one's it's it's OK. Like it's uh, it's not like offensively bad. This like look at that editing there, just like the the quick you know oh my god it's so bad and so lazy. It's, it's like because uh, when you do that when you when you literally just show a zombie walking and you speed it up like that, it takes away any fear or attention. And then it cuts immediately to her running over the spikes and it's all these jump cuts like what they did with uh what's that Liam Neeson movie uh, Taken where he like tries to jump the fence in one of the sequels and it's like twenty three jump cuts. Uh, for him just to jump over the fence. That's what we just saw there with her driving. And so when you, I don't know, but that's my other thing is like you, having scenes like that doesn't make sense. Like uh, Res Evil, there was, what was it? Res Evil 2, there was a truck driver and he's driving and he, and he you know, flips over and crashes in front of the police station. There's an explosion. They're replicating that in the new movie, but they kind of cleared out the street. They had a guy... You know, they didn't add a bunch of other cars. Like the video games, you can get away with that because no one's actually getting hurt. A giant truck full of gas can drive through four cars before it explodes in a video game. In real life, if you're doing a stunt, they cleared the street and they had them flip over and they have the gas pour out. And then eventually it explodes, uh, we saw in the trailer. So that is one stunt person doing something that they rehearsed a dozen times and doing their job. In this one, they were changing stunts at the last minute, which is really unsafe to do. If you're going to change a stunt, give yourself another day or half a day of rehearsing it before you, you know, I guess do it. You know, it's like you got to really, I don't know, you got to be careful with that. Um, because obviously you get situations where people like Ricardo are killed um, and people like Olivia are injured. And then, like I said, a boulder fell on a third person and that tore ligaments in their arm. So. Um, then again, you have, so the red queen explains Alice like, all right, I, I'm, I'm still alive. I'm the red queen. And it's cause you got to bring that back. And they have Mila's daughter playing the red queen, which is fine. Like I'm not against those types of things, but, uh, like her bringing her daughter in and, and, uh, and starting her career and stuff like that's fine. I mean, uh, I am a fan of Millie Jovich, even though I don't like most of these movies. Um, and I am critical of her husband because I don't think he's a very good writer, and, and that's how, why we got these movies is I, I think they're just really badly written, unnecessarily badly written. Like, I feel like more effort could have been put in and, and a better job been done. But those jump cuts there of like her spinning and falling and, and then all of a sudden she's standing up. It's like, it's so bad. And like, why have it? Like, why have these scenes in these movies? Um, I don't know. She could have just drove the car uninterrupted right into raccoon city but they got to do all this nonsense and stuff and i don't know or they could have just she could have drove the car and they could have um blown out a tire and she could have crashed and then they capture her but i don't know it th these movies just they they make the weirdest decisions i feel like a lot of decisions they make on the day i feel like they start filming something and they go, you know what? That's a good idea. Let's do that. Let's do that. And although that sometimes happens, that's usually with dialogue, <laughs> you know, it's usually like someone comes up with an idea for a line or how to enter a scene. Um, but it's not really like people changing the, you know, like the overall course of the film. And I feel like that's, it happens a lot in this movie because Paul L. W. Sanderson is the writer too. I feel like he's like, ah, you know what? I can, let's change this. Or, you know what? I saw the set. So let's do more with this set. He did a lot of that in the first Resident Evil movie where he walked in and he saw the set where the tram is. And he was just like, eh, let's do more here. Let's film more of the movie here. And uh, I don't know. I, I'm very critical of this guy because, like I said, uh, people are injured. Someone's dead. And all four, just a terrible, terrible movie. Like, there's so many things in here. Like, so this uh, Dr. Isaac is like a religious guy. He's going around killing and cutting off the heads of a bunch of Miljovic clones. 
ah, God, I hate these. I hate this movie so much. Like, I can't even pretend like I'm interested in this. Like, I feel like this is just rant. Like, I'm just ranting. It's not even a commentary. I'm just moving from one random thought to another as things pop up on screen because the movie's random. It's it's just uh, like, look at all the jump cuts, cutting to all the people, the banging and stuff. They're, they're trying to act like this is, I mean, this is seizure inducing. I'm not even looking at the screen right now because I, I have to lower my head a lot in this movie because there are so many things in here that could probably trigger an actual seizure um, because of how frenetic these scenes are and look at that all of a sudden there's just like an army of zombies behind them it's this is where they spend their money and to me it's it's a waste of money having these scenes like this um paul w anderson he he it feels like he never wants to actually make a resident evil movie it feels like he always wants to make a mad max movie or a um omega man movie or something you know or john john carpenter film the one thing that scared me a little bit about Johannes Roberts, who's making the new Res Evil, he's also writing and directing, uh, and that worries me a little bit because um, I don't think anyone should. You should have a writer and you should have a director as two different people. I mean, who knows? It could work out for the new movie. We'll see. Him trying to cram in the stories of Res Evil one and two just feels like fanboy stuff, though. So I get a little worried about that. And then plus, when he says just like. Paul W. Sanderson did. Paul W. Sanderson is a big John Carpenter fan. So is Johannes Roberts. And he's like, you know, I wanted to make a movie that was like a John Carpenter film. And I'm like, why don't you make a Resident Evil movie? Like with its own feel and vibe and tone. Um, you know, why, why are you pulling? Like, I understand filmmakers are inspired by other filmmakers sometimes, but to me, if I was approaching a Resident Evil movie, I would look at the games and I'd be like, okay, we're not going to copy this, obviously. Like, we need to translate it and adapt it. But to, to, you know, it's one thing to do an homage scene to, like, a movie. But when you just straight up copy things, I don't really like that. So Paul Davis Anderson did a lot of copying throughout these six movies uh, from, you know, Cube and, uh, like I said, Omega Man and, and a bunch of different movies, sci-fi movies throughout the years, um, Mad Max. Johannes Roberts, it sounds like he's like, well, I want to do something like Precinct 13, but with zombies, if that's where his inspiration stops, then I'm okay with that to an extent. Because that's him just saying, okay, uh, Precinct 13 had an, uh, an ensemble cast, and I'm trying to go for that vibe, but I'm using the game for inspiration, you know, more so than these movies clearly did, then I would say that's okay. I would rather them get more inspiration from the games than the than like other movies that they're just fans of uh, because that just drives me nuts i'm like i don't want a resident evil movie that feels like a mad max with zombies like that's not what i want at all that's not resident evil <laughs> that's mad max with zombies um and that's that's always my issue with these movies like this all this stuff this stunts on the top of the the uh whatever this tank thing is um I don't know. They're like in all these jump cuts, like all these jump cuts of people, like they can't even like fight each other. Um, and the, the weird thing is, is on the day when you're filming this, they're doing a lot of stuff on, up on the, on the roof of this tank. Like they are punching each other and kicking each other and they're doing these moves. Um, and, uh, and, and you have some editor who's cutting around it, making it look like, that they're not doing these moves, <laughs> you know? Um, I don't know, man. There's just, there's so much. This editing is so bad. And these moves here where she's like, all right, I'm, I'm going to sidekick it and, you know, shove its head into this and I'm going to dodge this knife and twist his arm and, and all these jump cuts. And it's like, what move are you making here? Like, I understand the previous movies had a lot of this in it, but... None of this is Resident Evil. Uh, no one in Resident Evil moves or acts like this. Um, you can, I guess you can say Ada and Leon sometimes in Resident Evil 4 and 6 go a little bit above and beyond with their maneuvers compared to before. But uh, it doesn't get like this too much. Um, like there, what's that scene in Resident Evil 4 where... Paul W. Sanderson, he basically rips off a, a fight from the 
game. Uh, so yeah, Resident Evil Afterlife, there's a fight in the game, or Resident Evil 5, the video game, it's Sheva and Chris versus Wesker. And Paul W. Sanderson replicates that fight shot for shot, which I think is really lazy, but he did it shot for shot in Resident Evil 4 um, in the fourth movie, Afterlife. But at least that's inspired from the game, even though it's a direct copy. And that's kind of my problem with him is that when he copies stuff, it's always a direct copy. He doesn't know how to actually translate something or homage something. He only knows how to copy things. And that's kind of what this is. And uh, this was another one of those movies. So this actor that just popped up here, the the Chinese guy um, firing. I'm ashamed I don't know his name because I, I, he's a very talented dude. Um, so I'm sorry I don't know have his name off the top of my head right now. But um He's one of those situations where like your know, movie studios do this, where they're like, let's cast someone Chinese in our movie because it'll help the movie do well in China. Um, and we'll just put them in there as like a, you know, someone with a couple speaking lines. And uh, and I don't like that. If you're going to actually, if you want to represent some like a, a culture or or, um, you know, or even cater in a way, um, try to make them a bigger character. Like, uh, why put Dr. Isaacs, like, you know, if, make this guy the villain if you want, because he can, if he can do martial arts, which he does later on, you see him fight, I think with Alice and it's a pretty decent fight. Um, but if he has those abilities, like, I don't know, make him like get rid of Wesker and, and make him the, the henchman or whatever. Um, cause Wesker is just totally unnecessary in this movie. I think he's only in it because that guy probably didn't have any other movies to make and uh, and said he would be in this but anyway that that actor the chinese guy there he they they put him in this movie to um to get ticket sales up in china pretty much and they did the same thing in the fifth movie with the lady who played ada wong um and both times the characters i just feel like aren't really given anything they're not even characters like ada's not even really ada in the last movie she has a couple speaking lines and and uh that's it i mean it's 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 so bad. It's like, it, it's such a bad way to represent, uh, anyone, you know, I, I don't know. Like, uh, I grew up, I, I'm a big fan of Bruce Lee. And so I like seeing martial arts in stuff. And I, and if you threw one martial arts fight in here because the bad guy knows martial arts and Alice knows, you know, military training and she can go toe to toe with them, you'd put one scene in that's fine. But her fighting Dr. Isaacs, like, really? That guy knows like, enough kung fu to stand up to to alice like i don't know man whatever and she's supposed to have her powers still but she doesn't clearly um but now here we are we're like you know 25 30 minutes into the movie and we're back at raccoon city which is supposed to be a small midwestern town look at this effing place <laughs> it's like new york city um it's uh i think it's they changed it in the movies to be like toronto or something so toronto is a pretty big city but um, this is just ridiculous. And look at that building. It's like a fart away from collapsing. Why are every, why is everyone, I don't know, why are people hunkered down in a building that is so close to the blast radius that it's, if you fart twice, it'll fall apart. Um, and then here we got another scene where Mila gets knocked out by somebody and awakens in a new place. I mean, that's all these movies are. Paul Anderson, he doesn't know how to get characters from point A to point B without knocking them out. And having them wake up. Like. Ridiculous. And then that was so dramatic. Why was that guy just standing over her. Getting ready to inject her. Like why bring her all the way back there. Why not just inject her in the street. Like. <laughs> it's, it's, all so they can do this like. Claire reveal. Um, which why wasn't Claire already there. That, isn't that guy her boyfriend or something. Like. Oh my God, I hate this movie. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm just, I'm just a, a big whiny baby. Like when people whine about the new movies, that's why I call it whining. Because I know I whine about these movies. And I know it's, it's not very, it's not a good look. You know, like if you don't like these movies, you just don't like them. Find ways to be critical of them. I try, but I can't help but rant about this movie. Like this movie I saw in the theater and I, I, I really was upset that I even went. Um, and I can't even remember why I think I was going to go with a friend and he bailed at the last second, but I decided, you know what, I'm just going to go out of curiosity and I am a Resident Evil fan. 
So maybe, maybe, maybe it'll at least be dumb fun, like a few of the other ones have been, like one or two of the other ones have been. I was wrong. Uh, this movie just agitates me all the way. Um, I don't even know why they put little kids in these movies, because they never, especially this one, it's the last movie. So <laughs> it's like the, the, the little kids that have been in the previous movies, they've never come back. There was um, Mila's daughter, quote unquote daughter with Carlos clone, um, and, uh, she never, she's not in this movie, uh, the, she's like deaf, I think. Right. And then there was Angie Ashford in the second movie. I think the books explain that Angie died, uh, between the events of the second movie and the third movie. But in the third movie, Paul Anderson was just like, eh, we can't get that character back or actor back. So forget it. And then same with, uh, Kmart. She was another young kid that was in these movies and they were just like, eh. Well, we don't need Kmart, so she never popped up again. So I don't know. I don't even know why they bother. I'm surprised they brought Claire back. Like, cause, cause, and and the weird thing is Claire shows up and goes, "Oh my God, Alice, I know who you are," and that's usually not the case in these movies. Uh, but then she also never brings up Chris. Like, uh, I don't, I don't think maybe there's a line where she says, "Where's Chris?" and then Claire just doesn't answer, showing that um, she, you know, that maybe uh, Chris died. But, uh, yeah, we'll never know because because these there was plans, I think, to have Chris, but in this movie. But where would you even put him? Would you just made him one of these random guys on the team? And that's all he would have been. It's just some random dude. Like, no wonder if I would have got the script for this movie and Chris was just one of the guys in the background. I wouldn't have done this movie either. I'd been like, dude, screw you, man. I was already a non-character once in these movies. Because I like Wentworth Miller, and I thought he was a great choice for Chris Redfield. Um, but when he, in the the fourth movie, they put him in there, and then they put Claire in there, but they give Claire amnesia through the whole movie. So she doesn't even know Chris is her actual brother. So I'm like, so what's the point of having them together? And then at the end, she goes, at, like right before the final fight with Wesker, she goes, I remember everything. Oh my God, Chris, let's go fight Wesker. <laughs> You're just like, what? Like, oh my God. So anyway, that's a rant about the fourth movie. We already did a commentary on that. But this here where Mila, with her superpowers apparently, got hit with a boulder. She didn't do like some amazing stunt flip over it um, and land perfectly on her feet, which that would have made more sense for the quote unquote character. <laughs> but uh, she was distracted by that that reflection, that pen light from the, the rooftop. But look at all this. Look at look, This is like I said, this is like a Mad Max, like, I don't know. And how come there are, aren't already zombies here moving towards them? Like, I mean, normally the, the world, the previous movies established that wherever there's, you know, living flesh, the hordes of zombies will eventually make their way there. So I'm just surprised that this place isn't already overrun by zombies. Um, I know this place was nuked many years ago, but uh, again, I don't know why people would hang out here. They got to be getting hit with radiation, I'm sure. Because uh, clearly 20 years hasn't passed since Raccoon City was destroyed. Because um, no one's 20 years older than they were in the first movies. Or at least they don't look it. I mean, yeah, Miljovic has not aged a day, man. She's she uh, she's like Paul Rudd. Like they don't <laughs> they just don't age. But this whole thing here where it's like Isaacs is talking to Wesker, but that Wesker on the screen is actually answers to a different Isaacs and all this stuff. It's like, who cares? Like Dr. Isaacs wasn't some amazing like villain in the previous movies. I'm sorry. Like he popped up in the little bit in the second movie and then into the third movie. And to me, I'm like, that's it. That's all you needed him in. He turned himself into like a proto tyrant and died. But to say that he's actually like the founder of Umbrella along with old Mili Jovovich is, I don't know, just weird. And now here, what are we, like 35 so minutes into the movie and we meet um, Batwoman. <laughs> I'm, I'm blanking on her name right now, but I think she, or Ruby Rose, Ruby Rose. Um, so this character was literally made up for Ruby because I guess Paul and W. Sanderson and Mila were just fans of hers from I think she was in Orange is the New Black or she was on some TV show and they just liked her. Um, and so they were like, all right, let's let's uh, cast her in this movie, um, which is cool. You know, like uh, 
I mean, there are people that like I'm a fan of that. I'm sure if I was in their shoes or position, I would want to do something similar. Like, Hey, I'd always wanted to work with this person. Like I think Michelle Williams said that about Tom Hardy. So that's why she took the role for the Venom movie. Cause she was like, you know, I've always wanted to work with Tom. And, uh, and so when I got off, you know, offered to audition or, you know, be cast in this, I, I jumped at the chance because Tom was in it and that does happen sometimes. So I'm not so much against that, but my issue with the character is that, you know, she's not really one <laughs> like, like, uh, the character Ruby Rose plays is like, she, she gives her whole origin right there in like two sentences a minute ago, uh, where she talks a little bit about her background. And then she's really a blank slate after that for the rest of the movie. She uh, operates the the lift or the crane and then, and then gets sucked into a fan later. <laughs> and that's like, that's it. That's the extent of these characters is that they tell you in, in 30 seconds who they are. They're like, yeah, my name's Brad Vickers and I was a pilot and, uh, and I went into the woods once and, uh, and my team got killed or whatever. And, and then he goes, and then after that, you never see him do anything like worthwhile. He's, he doesn't fly anything. He doesn't shoot anything. He, he just w- walks around and says a line or two and then gets killed. Uh, and if, I'm just, Brad Vickers obviously is a character from the games that is not featured in any of the movies, but I was just using that as an example where they just, I'm guy A and I'm girl B and that's it. That's all we are. That's all we do. The real star of this movie is jump cuts. Um, because there's so freaking many. We just saw, oof, I don't know, like from the last time we were on the roof with these characters to, to this point right here, we probably saw like 15 jump cuts in the span of like 10 seconds. <laughs> like it's, it's so unnecessary. And this, what well, this is what I love too. So this is what I mean about characters and everyone's stupid. Um, and Paul Anderson is stupid because, uh, all these people that were managed to survive in this big colla- building that looks like it's going to collapse. They, they literally Mila shows up and says, here, let's do this. Let's measure this and write 30 yards and, and then shoot, shoot, make a trebuchet and launch these things. And, you know, I met Ruby Rose. I'm going to show her how to like launch flaming barrels. And it's like, what? Like, <laughs> like they couldn't have figured that out on their own. Haven't they been surviving this whole time? Um, and then they do this where they they fall for the bait of one human who's probably already infected. Um, and I get it. Like, you 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 know, you want to see them be heroic and actually save people because these movies don't like uh, they full on don't save people in most of these movies. Um, but uh, but to see them try is something. I mean, I saw uh, maybe I shouldn't give them too much crap here. At least they're trying. But that lady could be infected. Or this could be the case where, yep, she just gets shot. Yep, I don't know. Just, whatever. At least they they tried, I guess. I I guess I shouldn't be mad that they tried to save people, but um, look where it got them, though. That was cool. I do like that. Even though it was like a million jump cuts, the guy pinning the zombie by the hand. And then, yeah, I mean, that's pretty neat. So right there, that guy, so here's the boulder. I think this is the boulder that falls on the unnamed stunt person that it tore ligaments out of their arms. Um, But look at that. They're even ripping the building apart to like survive. Um, yeah. So I think one of those people, a boulder fell on and yeah, it messed them up, I guess. It's just tragic, man. For all these dumb scenes that they jump cut around anyway, like it's, it's so, cause I was thinking I saw the new trailer for the new movie and I was like trying to keep an eye out for scenes where I'm like, Oh, could a stunt person be injured there? Um, could a person be shot, you know, with a, you know, an actual bullet. Cause obviously that happened recently. Um, I think like, I don't know the full details, but I think like a, kind of like a Brandon Lee, even though it's not a one-to-one comparison, but there was a scene where like a gun went off and it, it killed somebody. Um, I killed like a camera person, uh, the DP, I think, and the shot, the director as well. 
um, with, with Alec Baldwin. And like I said, I don't know all the details, but it sounded pretty bad. And so I was, I watch movies like with that stuff in mind. Cause I'm a big Brandon Lee fan. Like I said, I was a Bruce Lee fan. I said that earlier, uh, the way Brandon died too, was very tragic. And, and so I'm always very aware of like when guns are actually pointed at people on sets. Uh, I, I pay attention to that kind of stuff in movies because, um, I think about how even dangerous that can be. So these movies just feel like every chance of something unsafe to happen, they do it. <laughs> like, uh, I think in the first movie there was, they were saying like these cables that were hanging from the roof. If one of them snapped, it could have come down and cut one of the actors in half. And it's like, why would you put them in that situation for a resident evil movie? So when I watched the new one, I was like, okay, I saw the, the truck flip over, but that was on like an, a mostly empty street. Like when it flipped over, there was no cars around it for it to, you know, run into and cause the, the, um, the stunt to go wrong. So I was like, okay, so they, they were safe. Um, whenever they're pointing guns at stuff in the new trailers, it looks like CGI monsters that they're pointing at. I mean, there's a couple with zombies. Um, so that did al alarm me a little bit. So I don't know. I'll have to keep an eye on maybe if some of you heard, if anyone was injured on the new Resident Evil set, um, you know, I'd like to, to know about that because, uh, that will, whether I like the movie or not, I will be critical of stuff like that. I, I, stunts, stunts is already a dangerous profession. Um, things can go wrong all the time. And, uh, and that's why it's important to be safe, especially when you're dealing with ammo. Um, you know, and th there's so many things, like I said, that can go wrong. So you have to be smart. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll keep an eye out, but so far I haven't heard of anything like that, but it also looks like they don't put themselves in that scenario. There's no scenes in the new movie where a character's doing this bullshit where they're like, you know, uh, swinging down over fire, jumping into a crowd of zombies on cables that could potentially cut them in half. You know, like it, it's just, you don't see, you're not seeing this dumb ass shit in the new movies. And I mean, you shouldn't, it's resident evil. It shouldn't have that stuff. I know resident evil four, five and six went over the top with their action. Um, and I think to me, like, I mean, my four, I think is a pretty beloved game. But five and six are, are trash. Um, five has is less trash than six, but but not by much. Uh, and I think most fans didn't like the the direction the games went, and that's why seven and eight kind of went back into a different direction and and try to bring horror elements back to it. Especially seven, uh, eight, not so much. I wasn't very afraid playing eight, but seven, I was. Um, eight kind of did what Resident Evil five and four did, which is they would just overwhelm you with enemies. And they thought that would bring you fear, but it really, it didn't bring fear. It just brought like, you know, um, you know, it made, it made some things a little tense because you're like, oh my God, am I going to run out of ammo before I kill all these things? But it wasn't like a fear thing so much, just more of like, a, okay, I have like 20 targets instead of two. And Resident Evil 7 was pretty good about giving you like two mold creatures and you have like four shotgun shells to take care of both of them. And that to me was a, a better tense fear. Um, so yeah, this fight here, look, I mean, some of these are, these are really done. These moves are really done. Right. But you wouldn't know. Cause right then and there, just him kicking her twice was like seven cut, uh, seven cuts. But you know, on the set, that guy actually did that move in one take probably, but they cut around it. Um, so yeah, that's just, oh my God, it's so annoying. They do that in like snake eyes and a, and a couple other movies that have come out where, the actual stunt people, Mortal Kombat, actually Snake Eyes, I think was a little bit better about it, but Mortal Kombat did it so much where they had all these great martial artists, but you really couldn't tell when you watch the movie because they cut around all their action scenes, the way that scene was just cut. So I don't know, man, I, I like I said, um, and then like that cheap jump scare, but it was still edited to where it wasn't done in one take. Um, and I'm not saying one take is always the answer. You can do multiple takes or multiple cuts to make an effective scare. The problem is that where maybe you can do it in two or three cuts, this movie does it in like seven or eight. And it and it takes away the fear. It takes away the tense moments and and everything. But yeah, so Mila's like, hey, I came in. I helped you. I brought this you know, these zombies to you. And, uh, and now I'm going to, uh, you know, light your building on fire and cause it to crumble. And we're going to lead zombies into it. And it's, I mean, there's, there's so much that you're just like, man, these people were better off without Alice around. Um, 
And then this, why are all those zombies just standing there? Why weren't they like running in to like attack them? I mean, that's one guy. Um, I don't know. Whatever. It's one guy who knows martial arts pretty well too. So I'm sure just like Alice, he'll escape from that, that darn thing. The, 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 you know, being trapped to the, or tied to the tank. And then, I don't know, like the ticking clock of like, this is how much time you have. Like, like that's going to add drama and tension to this, but it doesn't because you're never really afraid for Alice in any of these movies. Um, and it was funny because leading up to this, I think a lot of people were like, oh my God, she, she may actually die in this one. She may, and I'm like, you're fucking insane. <laughs> She's not going to die in this movie. You know? And they're like, please, three C, uh, 20 minutes ago, I, I, I made eye contact with you. So I'm a character now. Can I come with you just so I can die in the next scene? <laughs> and then this, like, so we're about to get into like the final act of this movie where we start learning the, the big plan Umbrella had. Like, why the F would Umbrella purposely release a virus and then uh, not cure it immediately or whatever and try to look like heroes and make their stocks go up or whatever? Because they could have, like, made a dummy corporation called Not Umbrella, you know, or something else. And, uh, and then have and say the virus came from them or blame another country and say the virus came from them. And then they could have been the ones to make the cure and their stocks could have gone up and they could have all been rich. But instead what they wanted to do was all these one percenters went into the hive and under the hive is a secret lab, a secret, secret lab way under the hive, this lab here that they just added just now where the real Dr. Isaacs is with Wesker. And this is where they've been planning all this all along with the red queen <clears throat> And all these one percenters that paid them money to release a virus so the whole world whole world would die to, I don't know, population control or something. And then the plan was is that after like 10 years underground, they would be awakened to a, an empty earth free of humans. And then they could rebuild the world the way they want it to be rebuilt. The problem is, is everyone in this fucking room is one percenters who don't know how to you know, uh, use a wrench or <laughs> change a fucking light bulb. Um, and I'm like, well, who's going to rebuild the world? You need a workforce. And I think they were saying at one point, oh, we can use zombies as a workforce because we can, at this point, we can start, you know, mind controlling them or whatever. But it's so bad. Like, look at the destruction of just this one city. And all over the world, I think in one of the movies, they said that all the water dried up, so the oceans dried up. But then, like, um, the very next movie showed a full ocean and it showed glaciers and stuff and plant life. And you're like, wait, I thought all that died. So like, I mean, these movies are so poorly thought out and so awful. And I know some people are like, oh, dude, you're nitpicking. No, I'm not. When you have a franchise last for six movies and you have all these world building elements or story elements and you don't stick to them and you retcon them constantly, then you're not even, you show no effort in caring about your world. So why should I give you, a, like, why should I care one? And why should I give you a pass? if you put in that little effort. Now, of course, everybody runs but Alice, and so she can get one shot off and look cool. They do that in the other movies where Alice is like unarmed and someone grabs a gun and they can shoot the enemy themselves, but they throw it to Alice. Like, Alice, here's the gun. Do it for us. And like this movie, they're like all these people living in that building and zombies are coming. They're like, what do we do? And Alice is like, I know. I got a plan and her plan basically fucks up their whole building and gets half of them killed. <laughs> it's like, like, and yet she's still a leader and I don't know. And then, Hey, look, there's the guy who was not a character 20 minutes ago who made eye contact with her on the tank and he just there so he can get eaten by a dog. Oh my God. And why is this? You see, get it. Cause it's a junkyard. It's full of dogs. Like, oh, whatever. <laughs> Dogs that jumped off with them. You know, in real life, man, you would land right on somebody. That would suck. Ma imagine jumping off and then, uh, by the way, dogs can swim. Most dogs. Um, 
but I'm sure mutated dogs can. But just imagine jumping off of that and then Alice lands and then you're like, you can't change your trajectory too much in the air. So like you land right on top of Alice and your boots just connect with her back of her head. Like that would suck so bad. That would be real life though. If I jumped off that, I would have landed fine, but someone would have landed right on top of me and broke my collarbone. <laughs> like it would have been so awful. Um, yeah. So, all right. So here's the survivors. They made it. Oh, except that guy. Um, that's okay. He gave us his origin in like two lines of dialogue earlier, so we don't need him. And of course there's a traitor on the team. Um, and of course he's going to survive. And even though there's multiple times where he could have died. In fact, that Dr. Isaac's tank shot a missile right at him with Claire. <laughs> like, so, so when they do the twist of like Claire's boyfriend's a bad guy, it's like, yeah, no shit. Who cares though? Like, even if you were surprised by that, you, you kind of probably went, Oh, I didn't see, uh, who gives a shit. That was probably your reaction because who cares? And here, this is my favorite. Um, the dogs just stop. Why? No reason. They just stop. Because because we need these characters to get into the base. Um, but she's like, whatever's down there, they're afraid of. And it's like, there ain't nothing down there. Like, there's just a bunch of one percenters locked in their cryostasis. Like, there's there's nothing keeping this, the dogs out. There's no giant liquor monster or a G virus monster. Um, there's the bloodshot, I guess. I think that's what it's called. It's a creature from Resident Evil Six that nobody gives a shit about. That they thought they could put in this movie and it would make this movie cooler, but it didn't. Oh yay! A fight. Oh whatever. See, it's tense. She could get crushed. It's like oh my god. You don't need any of this. Take this out of your Resident Evil movie. And they tried to do like, I mean, that, that CGI is so bad, but they were like, let's, let's make it slow motion and make it dramatic. He's reaching for her. It's like, he's a no name character. No one cares. <laughs> like no offense to the, the actors in this movie, but they don't play characters. They're not giving, they're not given anything to do uh, except die. Uh, and not like die like in a slasher film, because in those, at least with the slasher films, you have characters that are like, oh, he's the jock and he's the rude one or whatever. And oh, he's the nerd and he's like the the hopeless romantic one. And they all have like these personalities um, or they fit some kind of cliche stereotype. This movie does. Everyone's just like grunty survivalist and they don't really have any, I, you know, anything to them. They're, they're just blank slates. Generic guy, generic girl, that's all they are. Oh, look, the Red Queen is secretly helping Alice. And and if you want answers of who you are, like this is the Umbrella Corporation. Dr. Isaacs was the guy who, you know, created this whole plan. And uh, it's like, you know, in the video game, there's Oswald E. Spencer, a character that even the video games didn't do that much with. But he was at least in charge of... Um, of the umbrella. It was like him, Dr. Ashford and uh, James Marcus. And they were the three guys who founded umbrella. Right. And they were basically looking for immortality. They wanted to live forever because they, as they got, were getting older. They were just like, yeah, it sucks getting old and we want to survive uh, the best we can. And, uh, and we want to outlive people and live forever because as we find out in Resident Evil eight, uh, at least with Oswald E. Spencer, he met a woman in whatever country they were in in Resident Evil 8. I can't remember now. But uh, she like she was living longer than a normal human life. And he wanted that. Um, and they so they were both pursuing it. And she found it through um, the, the mutamycete or whatever it was that is uh, created the mold in Resident Evil 7. She went that route with her studies. And Oswald e. Spencer went and found a flower in Africa um, that grew underground that didn't need sunlight to grow. And from there they developed the progenitor virus and from there the T virus and then so on and so forth, G virus and T Veronica and all the other stuff. So there's like a, a something you can follow in the games and a purpose for these characters. This purpose of, Hey, let's infect the whole world and live underground until the virus passes. And then we'll come out. 
that's so ridiculous. You can't even predict when you release a virus like that into the, the wilds of the world. Plus, not only that, but um, Spence in the first movie, the reason the outbreak happened in Raccoon City was because Spence was going to steal it and sell it on the black market. So unless they reached out to Spence and pretended they were a third party and said, hey, if you steal us a T-virus, we'll, um, you know, we'll, you know, if you do that for us, we'll pay you millions of dollars just to scam him into doing it. But even then you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't know about an outbreak. Like, you know, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Like, unless they said, look, we'll give you a $2 billion if you steal a sample of the virus and on your way out, you smash a vial and release the virus into the, the facility. But even then, it's the facility right above these one percenters that are locked underground. They it's definitely share, they share an air vent system, most likely. So, oh, I just don't understand the logic. They just wanted to go back to Raccoon City. And, that, and that's all Paul Anderson thought. He just said, oh, let's just bring it back home to Raccoon City. We can make the marketing for the movie. You know, Resident Evil returns home or whatever. It's, it's, so, it's done so poorly. It's done haphazardly. And it's clearly like... He comes up with an idea and then never thinks it through. He just goes, okay, that's the idea. We're doing it. Um, and I, uh, I, I, I can't stand it. So here we go. Bunch of jump cuts. They got their mission. They got to go in. And, uh, and now we, I guess, officially start the final act of the movie. Raccoon City. So this is what is insane. Is like, so this is the one that got his hand cut off earlier. Uh, he, he was d down near them, right? Where the dogs were. Didn't they show him like hiding? Or, or, or maybe it was before they left to go to the dogs. But he, I don't know. He went back to the entrance of the city to just get brought in by another tank. I don't know. Whatever. Who cares? Who gives a shit? <laughs> and he's, he's a decent actor. I mean, this guy, he definitely plays a good bad guy. I've never seen game of Thrones, so I, I don't know how he is on that show, but I'm sure he's fine. And I, I think, but that's what these movies became like after the second one or third one, they were just like, we don't need a reason to bring back actors. We just want to bring them back because we want to work with them again. And to me, I'm like, I get it. I, you know, that's cool that you want to hire friends and people you worked with before and because you have a camaraderie with them. But there, this is based on a universe that has a lot of fans. And I think those fans would have liked to have seen other characters brought in, like Rebecca Chambers, who we still don't have a live action version of. Uh, Barry Burton, which they put into the fifth movie, but he wasn't even really Barry. Not really. Even though I like uh, Kevin who played him, um, I still was just kind of like meh about him in that movie. Um, and there's, you know, I don't know. I hate Billy Cohen, but I know he has fans, so you could have put Billy Cohen in one of these movies. There's just, there is a world that this stuff is based off of, you know, off of, but you wouldn't know that when you watch these movies because it doesn't, they just, they're like, oh, let's, as long as we say umbrella and as long as um, Alice kicks people and as long as there's a zombie and a dog, like we're fine. <laughs> it's like, so to them, Resident Evil is all these artificial things that, that don't really, um, that's all they are. They're just like surface level stuff. Oh, Chris, he's just a costume. So we'll just get this actor who has, you know, and we'll put him in like a, 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 a gray costume, I guess, uh, which isn't even really Chris's costume. Um, they put him in like a jail outfit or something. And then Leon and Resident Evil 5 Retribution, they were like, oh, let's just get a guy and put him in Leon's jacket, even though it's way too cold for a jacket that thin. Um, but they, whatever, like, <laughs> it doesn't matter. As long as he looks like Leon. So that's why when people are critical of the new movie and they're like, well, Avon Yogi doesn't look like Leon. I'm like, Okay, but what? But but maybe he acts like Leon. So don't you want to at least see if he acts like Leon? And actually, from what I heard, Leon is a major character in the movie. Like he he's got a pretty decent arc. Because I saw an interview the other day 
with um, Avon Yogia, who plays Leon, and Tom Hopper, who plays Wesker in the new movie. And they say, they're like, yeah, we probably have two of the biggest arcs in the movie next to Claire. And I thought that was interesting. And I'm like, that's that's great that we get that much screen time with those characters and enough to where they'll actually affect the plot and, and stuff. Um, because in this movie, none of these other characters affect the plot. In fact, Mila's character, Alice, doesn't even really affect the plot. She just is the only one that kind of perpetually moves through it. And occasionally her actions further the plot, but not really. Um, <laughs> sometimes not really. So yeah, here we got our big fan sequence where we clearly, it's just, it's time. It's been two whole minutes since someone's died. So we got to, we got to kill somebody else in just the dumbest way. And they went with Ruby Rose, someone who they were like, we got to get her in this movie. We we're big fans of hers. And, and she contributed almost nothing to this movie as far as character goes, because she didn't even have a character. Like she's not a character in this movie. She's a, she's a, a a sack of meat that gets killed right now. And Alice can't even save her. That's the other thing is like Alice, like everyone loves Alice, but look how many times she can't save people. Like, and look how many times she, like when people are safe and they're hunkered down, she shows up and fucks everything up for them. So to me, I'm like, why is, why is she, why is she a leader? Why are people listening to her? And honestly, why aren't they blaming her for, uh, Ruby Rose's death right here. She has superhuman strength apparently, and she can't even save one person. But then the fan it kills one person, and now everything shuts down. I think they explain this by the Red Queen shutting it down, and she's basically given away the fact that she's helping them, and that's how Wesker finds out that she's been helping them. The Red Queen's been helping Alice, but still, it's like one person dies, and the threat that could it, that fan could have kept going and just killed all of them. Like if Wesker really didn't want them to make it further, she would have just killed them all. But look, he's smiling like, ha, okay. But it's like, but why would the fans shut down after one like that? Like, I guess you could say there's a safety feature built into the, the engines where some, if some, if something get big got caught in there, it would naturally shut down. But even still, like, I don't, Wesker smiling. I'm just like, why doesn't he just turn the fan back on and kill more of them? Like it's, <laughs> <laughs> because it, it can't happen because now we need this scene where they crawl through these vents and then uh these vents that are way too big um and the weird thing is you don't even see them get into this vent like you just like th there's no they later on they show an elevator that connects this to the first movie um but them coming in here, like the, there's no geography to these places sometimes, even though they constantly show maps, you, they still, there's like, it's the geography's random because earlier the building that all the people were holed up in wasn't as close to the crater as it was when they get to the scene where they're standing at the crater and you can see their old building in the background. It looks way closer there than it did in the wide shot from earlier. Uh, and that's another continuity mess up. But, oh, look, 31 minutes. So this is the ridiculous part. Now, this is normally, if you're going to do something like that in a movie and you say like, all right, this is, there's 30 minutes left. Make your movie 35 minutes left in the actual movie. And I think that's what they're trying to go for here. But I don't know if it's down to the minute or not. But they, they, they tried it. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, they tried it, I guess, to give them a little credit, but they don't do it very well. Because the last, like, like when it says like there's four minutes left or five minutes left, it feels like 20 minutes. <laughs> like it just so much happens in the movie. But that could just be because of jump cut. So, um, so maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Was oh, that water? Oh, nope. I don't even know how this is like a trap, like whatever. It's gonna cut your hands off, bro. It looks like water. 
but oh, okay. But uh, so there is water, but the vent is above rocks. Okay, got it. So more jump cuts, more bullshit. Um, oh God, this scene's gonna give me a seizure. So I'm, I have my head down. The lights flashing is is not good. Um, and then look, this is a lab beneath the original one's location, I believe. Um, this is a lab there and there's like a woman zombie hanging in the background and there's all these vials and it's not clean or kept up. I guess they're saying this is a place from the first movie. Um, but it doesn't look like any rooms from the first movie. So, yeah, but now, now here we go. Here come the jump cuts and the bloodshot monster. I think that's what it's called. Which I, I mean, it's a, it's honestly when they said I saw an interview with Paul W. Sanderson before this movie came out, and he was like, "Yeah, we put the bloodshot in this." So, you know, one of my favorite monsters from Resident Evil Six, and I go, "What the hell's a bloodshot?" Like I literally didn't even know what he was talking about, <laughs> and I went and looked online. I said, "Oh," and I, I don't even know. Maybe it's not called the bloodshot. I'm just maybe I'm misremembering, but whatever the monster is, it's something you see in Leon's campaign in the caves underground for like, you know, a couple, like one level or something. And I was just like, who cares about this monster? <laughs> like, who cares at all? Um, but then look, this guy randomly shows up next to Mila because someone needs to die at the hands of this monster in the scene, but it can't be Mila. So we got to just randomly throw in this other guy um, to be here. So that zombie there, the one that's like, yeah, that's like a Res Evil 6 zombie. Oh, and there you go. Guy got his head bit by the bloodshot or whatever it's called. And it look, it happens so fast and it's like all CG and it's, ugh, whatever. And then look at her. She's just so confident. Like she's never seen this monster before, but she's just confident that the amount of bullets in each gun are going to do the trick. Like, and then she's just like, yeah, I'm a badass. Even though that guy just died. And now she's going to go back to being a little worried. Like, oh my God, whatever. God, these, these, that's what I'm saying. Like, there's a consistency to characters. And, and Alice is very inconsistent. And whenever she's shooting a gun or using a weapon, she's super confident. But then when she, like, when they need her to act a little afraid... She she tries to emote it, but she's not. She's not very good at it. Um, and so, yeah, look. So that's when she realized that the creature is like blind and it's like listening to her. Um, but it's done so quickly and so dumb that it doesn't add anything to the scene. Because normally you would want that. You'd be like, oh, let's create a monster that can only hear like a liquor or something like that, where it hears what you're, the noise you're making um, and doesn't really see you. And that's kind of what this is, but it does it so poorly. And then now look, she's just flipping over tables. and stuff. It's like all these dumb things you, I don't know. Why is she even running at tables? <laughs> like, like, uh, uh, whatever. And it's funny because people make fun of the new movie for the G monster. Now I will admit that one shot of the G monster in the trailer looked pretty bad, but there's a couple other shots afterwards that didn't. This creature looked pretty bad visual effects wise. Um, and, uh, and I don't know, I'm hopefully those same people are critical. The thing is these movies, like they don't get big budgets. They don't get a hundred to $250 million dollars. No matter how popular Resident Evil is, they're not going to make a movie with that kind of budget. So you're going to have to find a, a filmmaker, even though I don't like Paul W. Sanderson, he was the right guy to go to for the first one. He made Mortal Kombat successful, and he um, he probably knows how to stretch a dollar when it comes to making these movies. Um, unfortunately, that you know because of that and because the studio got used to that, that's why people ended up injured and dead on this film. 
But in the first movie, I think he did a lot of things to like stretch a dollar. Like I said earlier, he had that idea of reusing the room with the tram. Like they, they went to Germany and had got access by the German government to go down in these uh, train stations. And they filmed like, originally they had uh, scenes written out differently with different rooms to be different homages to the video games. But then when he saw that room with the tram, he said, you know what, we can do like, we can make this three or four different rooms in this movie, three or four different sets. And that's probably why that movie, they came in under budget. So I'm sure he's good at doing that kind of stuff in movies. And same with Johannes Roberts. It sounds like he knows how to stretch a dollar because he typically makes indie indie films or low budget or lower budget films, you know, that are like in the 20 to $30 million range um, or less. And that's kind of who you want to make Resident Evil um, because, and you want them to also be a fan, hopefully of the franchise or at least know about, enough about it to, to um, tackle the subject matter. But um, you, yeah, you don't want to get someone like, um, you know, like a, like, I don't know, a Zack Snyder or a Deli Villeneuve. First of all, they probably wouldn't even take the, the job. <laughs> like most people would probably like Resident Evil. Oh, it's a video game. Eh, like the, the, that's the Hollywood has that kind of stigma. So um, you would want someone who knows how to, like I said, to stretch a dollar. So if you give them a budget of like 50 million, they can do the most with that 50 million and they can hire people that can do the most with a, a small budget for their department. So they're, when people say, oh, the CGI doesn't look as good, it's like, well, if you're used to Marvel movies, which honestly, some Marvel movies, their CGI doesn't look that good either. And they spend 200 plus million dollars on a lot of their movies. So the thing is, you know, CG is always inconsistent. It's hard to do. It's a hard job and you got to get multiple people to do it. So if a movie has bad CGI consistently, I get critical. But if it does in one or two shots, I don't. This movie, like, uh, it's, I don't know, it's pretty bad. Like, that's all bad. Like, the, the background looks bad. That's, it's, they pulled that right out of Resident Evil 5 and it doesn't, you can tell they're not even there. Um, it's very clear that they're not even on that set. So to me, I'm like, why do that? Like you, you know, I do like when you build part of, so like that's what they're standing on that platform and the desk behind them. That's clearly all an, a practical set. And then the rest is green screen, obviously. Right. So that's good to take something that exists and, and enhance it with CGI but um, like this room does a little bit. Uh, this room enhances a little bit CGI, but this room looks better than the previous room because the previous room, there's too much going on. It's too unrealistic. Um, but for their story, they got to be like, hey, we got to show all the one percenters that are sitting in their cryo tubes to visually represent that in the story. So I'll give them credit for doing that, but the shot just looked bad. So when people say the new movie has, they're like, oh, it looks cheap. It looks bad. It's like, yeah, but these movies do at times too. And these movies have the same budget. So Resident Evil is always going to have that. If you're ever going to make a Resident Evil movie, you're probably going to make a movie that doesn't have the level of um, time and animation and animators and stuff to and money to make it, you know, look like a like a 10 star movie or something. It's just not going to happen. So, uh, so that's why I'm not as critical of that stuff. There are other people that are, and that's fine if that's your opinion, but there, I'm explaining why I'm not. The reason I'm not critical of it is because I know that you'll probably never see a, a Resident Evil movie with a budget of like $120 million. <laughs> it's just, I don't think it's going to happen. That could have blown her foot off. So, uh, that was a risky ass move. You could have just had like a, a dead body in there, like a head, and she could have put the head Again, you know, that would have been, that would have worked better. All right. So Wesker is going to capture Claire, I guess, whatever. And now Mill is down here with her boyfriend. And I think they're in that same room where the rocks were, where that dude fell and landed on the rocks. Um, oh my God. It's so elaborate. Why? Like umbra umbrella. And this is where Paul Anderson, this is like, this is Paul Anderson's fault. <laughs> umbrella spends money on the most unnecessary bullshit. Like why have a, why not just have a walkway across that water? Like, <laughs> ugh, whatever. 
So this being, um, do you see the wheelchair there? I think some fans who weren't paying attention to the beginning of this movie were probably thinking, oh, Oswald E. Spencer is going to come out of that tube and we're going to finally see Oswald E. Spencer. In the beginning, you, you uh, the earlier scene when they explain what Umbrella's dumbass plan was, um, you could tell it was a woman and you could tell it was Mila Jovovich the way her voice was. It was like an aged Mila Jovovich. So, um, so I knew it was going to be Mila coming out. So I think basically they're saying Mila is the Oswald E. Spencer of this movie universe. And she was looking for a way to cure her pageria the way her father wanted. And he wanted to use the T-virus to do it. And until they could, that's why there's clones of her. So they can experiment on her clones, essentially, to find the cure. Uh, whatever. And then this guy's like, hey, here's the cure right here. All you got to do is release it above ground and it'll spread throughout the whole planet. But you only but you only got like 20 minutes to do it, which is so unrealistic and dumb. Uh, the guy who plays Wesker, I think Sean something, he's got a good look. He's really young though. He's he's maybe a little too young for a Wesker, but he's got a good look. Like he 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 passes visually for the character. But again, I don't know, Wesker in these movies is he's so inconsistent. Like in one movie, he's the major threat. In another movie, he's like the CEO of Umbrella. In this movie, he's the henchman of the CEO of the um, of Umbrella. In the past movie, he was the hen he was the leader again, who was took over the White House for no reason apparently. Um, <laughs> so, in this movie, look at all these jump cuts with the flashing lights. I can't even watch it. My head is, it's like it's gonna give me a headache. Like, I can't watch this. Um, where she's thinking of all the different ways she can kill him. And then he verbalizes it, saying he knows exactly what she's thinking and that he can do it too because he's got combat software in him. God damn, I hate these movies. <laughs> I hate these movies so much. Um, oh, God. If you just make like martial arts a thing and combat training a thing that people know, and you don't make them too superhuman, then this might actually be impressive. The fact that he can counter the stuff and he's just like a, a CEO board member nerd guy, but it's not impressive. It's just, it makes you roll your eyes. Cause you're like, of course he can do that. Cause F and why not? <laughs> Paul Anderson's really great about uh, filming scenes that just eat up airtime. So, Hey, let's shoot a fight scene here but then let's not actually have a fight scene happen. So we'll shoot it three different ways to show three different outcomes, but then we'll show that really it's just the two of them are going to talk for a minute or two because my dialogue's so interesting, which it's not. <laughs> so, so, uh, yeah. Oh, thank God it's interrupted uh, the dialogue and we get old Alice. And this is where we finally learned that Alice this whole this whole time was a clone she was cloned and then um married to Spence and that they were both assigned to protect the entrance to the hive which you would think Spence was more important to their plan but clearly not I bet you if they could go back and change things they probably would have made Wesker Spence in the first movie um because that would have just made more sense to have Wesker be consistent throughout all six of these movies. Because Spence just was like, I don't know, some kind of lackey to release the virus and he meant nothing to them. But yet they still partnered him up with Alice. And then Alice, she wakes up in the first movie with no memory. So like, so did she have all of her memories before uh, she got her memories wiped out? Or was she a clone and she only existed for three weeks and then got married to Spence and lived in that mansion. Like, see, the more you think about Paul W. Sanderson's ideas, the worse they are. Uh, and the thing is, he probably didn't think about it once. He's probably just like, nah, if I think about this too much, it will fall apart. And he's right. <laughs> he's so right. And these are, you know, home videos, because like I said, this is Mila's actual daughter. That's an actual clip from the beginning of the movie where she ages why would they put that in there <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> 
where she ages right in front of the camera. I'm like, that's literally a shot from the intro of the movie. Why would they? Whatever. Save money, I guess. What? <laughs> but why? Why have that shot? These are the worst supervillains in all of existence. And honestly, these are the worst heroes <laughs> in all of existence. Because the world is already f just beyond fucked. It's so dead. The whole planet is so dead. And uh, and the, these weirdo rich people with their combat uh, programming and their brains and their and their different ideals and goals. I don't know. Like this is this is just the worst. They they're just no. They're acting evil for the sake of being evil. And if she was there, old woman or not, if she was there the whole time, how could she have not done anything? Like, I don't know, whatever. So here's where Wesker, so because he's not an employee anymore, the door shut on him. And then, oh, look, when she gave him his gun, she didn't load it with actual bullets because she knew he was a, a traitor. And see, Claire, of course, Claire can't shoot the bad guy because Claire's not Alice. So if she fires a gun, she has to miss. But don't worry, she can leave that guy for Claire. So Claire can kill him because he's on the ground. And uh, he's at point blank range. But God forbid Claire kill the other guy and actually prevent the bad guy from winning. So Wesker gets his leg chopped off pretty much. That's what the door, it slammed. It didn't come down on it. I, see, to me, I thought originally it came down on his shoulder and like cracked his collarbone and pushed him into the ground and then chopped into his leg and chopped it off. That would have made a lot more sense to me as far as like, you know, him being like taken out so easily. But uh, no, it, was, it looked like it just like from his ankle down or something was chopped off. And I'm like, well, I'm sure that hurts like hell, but. Wesker literally is superhuman. Like he didn't get his powers taken away and put back in like Alice did to make her inconsistent through all these movies. He's consistently since the fourth movie been superhuman. So it's, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> it's like, whatever. Who cares? It's the thing is like, I, I don't like this stuff. I definitely hate it, but I, I guess I used to be, and you saw, I mean, you heard at the beginning of this, I was really angry with a lot of stuff. And it's because these people get paid a lot of money to do their best. And I will argue that this is not their best. I may not like Paul W. Sanderson that much when it comes to his writing ability or his directing abilities um, or his choice in editors or whatever. Uh, but still, I'm sure he can do better than this movie. And I'm sure Mila can do better. And I'm sure the other actors who are literally given nothing to do can do better. But they're not. They're not given anything to be better. Um, but it was a kind of a clever way to take out Wesker, though. I do like that idea of, like, she fired him. And the Red Queen can't hurt employees. Um, but, the, but Alice, I mean, I'm sorry, old Alice cannot fire Dr. Isaacs. Because I guess he's like a board member above her. So she could at least fire Wesker, though. So I, I did like that. I mean, yeah, it's kind of clever. Although I, I think the door shutting on him is a little lame. But because uh, this is like one of the biggest villains of the video games. <laughs> and he gets taken out by a door falling on him. And just like, whatever. Like, <laughs> so, so bad. But now we have, oh, look, Red Queen. And then Claire and Alice are going to like double fight Dr. Isaacs. Um, and, but, oh, wait, he can predict everything they do. Ugh, whatever. These scenes are, uh, the editing, oh, my God. It's so bad. Because you can tell, I mean, like, this guy, uh, I mean, like I say, he's, he's a good actor, I guess, but 
I doubt he can do 90% of these moves. Um, and, and so all these cuts, like it's just, and then with the background and like, there's like flashing lights, like it's, it is, it's, uh, it's headache inducing and possibly Caesar inducing. Uh, so I'm not gonna look at the screen. I'm just gonna assume a bunch of bullshit's happening. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and, oh, look, I'm right. Probably most likely. So that whole time he could have just pushed one of them off the lift and he didn't because we can't have that happen. Claire, who's not even a superhuman, is able to get at least a, a punch in on him, which is impressive because normally they don't give characters like Claire anything to do. So I'm surprised she's even in this final fight, to be honest with you. But, you know, this this fight, it just it wouldn't make sense unless. I don't know, they ended up in the fucking laser room again which has been in four of these shit films. They just can't escape this stupid ass room. Ugh. Whatever. Oh, look, it still works. <laughs> but it doesn't have the same pattern that it had the last time. This time it has the pattern that the, the laser room Leon encountered in Resident Evil 4. <laughs> so it has a different pattern. Um, yep. You got to cut a little a little something off. And and still it hasn't turned into a giant um checkerboard yet like it did with uh one in the first movie. So now he's got a fighter because it, it didn't follow its original <laughs> programming. And look at all those clean marks on the, the walls there. I mean, that's neat that they paid that much attention to it, but it's still not, it doesn't actually line up with some of the patterns that, uh, that the lasers made. Um, didn't see that coming, huh? Didn't predict that, huh? So what she does to kind of defeat him to get her, um, to get her, I don't know, like her, the one up on him is, is pretty terrible. Like it, it is pretty bad. Um, she literally puts a grenade in his pocket right next to the, the antivirus or the cure. <laughs> Like, and luckily it doesn't blow him and the antivirus in half and waste it in this room. Um, so I'm like, my thing is, if you're going to do that, where she puts a grenade in him, have her do that on the surface, right? They get to the surface, which I don't even know why he's running up to the surface. If that's where she needs to go, why would he bring the virus closer to the surface for her? Um, I don't know, whatever, because he's a stupid villain. But to me, I would have brought him to the surface and then put the grenade. So when it blows up his stomach, it releases the virus too at the same time. Um, and that would have been cooler. Oh, wait, it's rearming because the Red Queen is involved and in helping out. This is so, oh my God, it's so bad. So it so just made a per so <laughs> he can just stand there and oh my god. So I will give one thing: they really beat the hell out of Al Alice in this movie, um, but she still is like has the one up, like always. <laughs> She's always like that. But it was kind of clever to to be a little fair when she when he saw you know, patting himself on the back for cutting her fingers off with the laser. You know, she, uh, she used that moment to put a grenade in his pocket. But if she was going to put the grenade in there, she should have grabbed the virus out. Yeah. To me, she should have put that in and grabbed the virus. So that way the virus is safe from this explosion. Boom. <laughs> 
<laughs> which would have done way more damage, I think, than than that. I mean, that's a lot of damage to his ribs there, but she could have easily fucking destroyed the the virus and released it here, and not it, it not go airborne outside. So what I'm saying is they could have done this this scene here outside, um, maybe. Uh, whatever. Luckily, that only took, even though it took 10 minutes of our actual life away from us, in the movie universe, that all of that from going in the tunnel downstairs, taking the elevator up, that only took about three minutes. Because that's how, because time is a construct and we can't be, um, we can't, we can't be critical of it, I guess, when it's inconsistent. So again, more bad CG background. And uh, like I said, I hope the people that criticize the new movie are, you know, are still criticize this too when the, when the effects are that bad. Um, I think the point is the people that aren't a fan of the new movies, I don't think a lot of them are fans of the of these ones either, to be fair to them. Um, but uh, but um, it's a case-by-case -case basis. I don't like to generalize. But I will say when people sound whiny, I like to say they're whiny because I know I'm whiny. <laughs> so, so to me, it's like, I know I'm fully capable of being a whiner too, but because I recognize it in myself is why I think I call it out sometimes when people whine about stuff. But to me, you typically won't hear me complain mostly about who they cast to play a character. You'll hear me complain about the, um, the actual character and like what they do with them. So like there's that new show coming out on Netflix, I guess, where it's Wesker and they got um, like a, a black guy to play him. And I'm not against that. Like I'm not against uh, who they cast to play Wesker. My issue with that show is because uh, obviously it's a new universe. It's like anytime something's translated, it doesn't take the games are still there. The comics are still there. That universe is still untouched and you can always go back to it if you want it. So I'm, I'm okay with interpretation when it comes to like the look of a character or something, but the, but the things that make a character, I'm l a little less lenient on. So when they say, oh, this new Wesker show is about a Wesker who's a father of two daughters and it's about him working for Umbrella and then the daughters 20 years later when they grow up, you know, trying to undo the, the things he helped create with Umbrella. That doesn't sound like a Wesker story to me. That sounds like a William Birkin story to me with uh, Sherry Birkin. Um, or you could have made the show about Wesker's son, Jake, and uh, William Birkin's daughter, Sherry, like Resident Evil 6, the game. And you could have had it to where it's them in the future. You know, uh, trying to, you know, and, and you don't have to tie it to the games, but what I'm saying is those characters already had kids, so you could have built off of them. But the... um. I don't know, but they, they're going in a completely different direction. <laughs> and what's weird is that show is being made by someone who was a showrunner of Supernatural. Um, even though he was a, he was a showrunner for Supernatural in the last like few seasons, um, which were arguably, you know, I'm very critical of. I do like those seasons overall, but there's a little bit more filler in most of those seasons than usual, than, the, than previous seasons. So, um, so I was both excited and a little concerned that he was doing Resident Evil. But then when I heard that idea, I was like, eh, eh, it doesn't sound like a Wesker story. It sounds like a Birkin story. All right. So she was going to just drop the virus. I don't know why she wouldn't have just, just broke it like with her two hands and just broke the bio in half. But she tried to drop it and the Dr. Isaacs caught it. And then the other Dr. Isaacs showed up and them two fought and killed each other. And then she picked it up again just to drop it again. I was like, oh my God. Like, that's Paul Anderson. Yeah, you got it. You know, do it all twice. Do everything twice or four times or 10 times. So I got to look down. That's too many flashing lights. So I can't watch this. But uh, now we have Claire. You thought the virus was going to kill Alice, but of course not. Why would it? Um, because they're like, oh, you have T virus cells in your body. But it's like she <laughs> there's like two two scenes or three scenes in this movie where she actually showed some semblance of superpowers, and then the other time she wasn't. So I didn't even know if she did have her powers in this movie or not. You can never tell. 
But this is like, oh, look, we're ending on a sweet, tender moment. The Red Queen, uh, you know, or old Alice downloaded all of her memories into this chip, this like, um, I don't know, it's like uh, eye, eye contact or something. And they're like, so just put it in and you'll have all the memories of your father, you know, James Marcus and all the good he tried to do with the T-virus. And uh, and meanwhile, this this cure is uh, is airborne now. So it's going to slowly, the winds or whatever, and the weather is going to slowly spread it out across the planet over time. Like that's the big reveal is that not everything undead or monster on this in the world is going to drop dead immediately. It's going to take like some time, at least raccoon city right now is probably completely clear of monsters. Um, but it's going to take time for it to spread around. And then Alice and them, they blew up all those one percenters. So as far as we know, there's only Jill, like Claire, as I said, Jill, but only Claire and uh, Alice right now. They're the only two people left on the planet, uh, as far as we know. Now, I think maybe they make a line. I can't, I may be misremembering this. I have this aunt playing with no audio, by the way, because I don't want to hear this movie at all. <laughs> I mean, I was listening to it a little bit earlier through an earphone, but about 20 minutes ago, I took that out. I just couldn't stand the dialogue anymore. Um, but maybe there's a line where she said, look, you know, my brother's still out there and Kmart and all them. They, they're still alive. I know it. Like, let's go find them. That would have been something to kind of set this scene up because really why is she driving to new york and then there's like a monster chasing her and she like smiles she's like yeah and by the way she didn't try to clean up at all <laughs> like between raccoon city and new york um but now she has another creature coming after her and she's like yeah my name's alice and i'm gonna drive around the planet and kill monsters and you're like but what's the urgency of that like why do that and like I said, so I'm thinking maybe there's a line that I just, you know, talked over or something where Claire says, you know, my brother's still out there, Kmart, Angie, we got to go find them. And maybe that's, maybe that's why she's driving towards the end. Cause otherwise I'm like, why don't you just hang tight in Raccoon City for like a couple weeks and just let all the neighboring towns get, you know, the monsters drop dead. And then I don't know, like, cause then what are you going to do? Like, you're going to burn the bodies. Cause then those viruses will still kind of I guess they won't be there because the virus died in them. I don't know, whatever. But now we got the ending credits. Uh, Paul Hazinger, who's the who's the um, composer of the movie, and uh, yeah, based on Resident Evil. Yeah, loosely based, <laughs> very loosely based. But some of the producers on this movie are producers on the new movie. Uh, I think someone said they saw Paul Anderson's name in the credits, but I didn't. Uh, if you look on, if you go, if you Google, you know, like a cast of a movie or something, they usually like Google or Yahoo will add names to things that aren't there sometimes. I don't know why they do that. So I typically go to IMDb. Oh, Lee Jun uh, G. He's the, he was the actor who I was talking about earlier, who's from China. And he just comes in, they give him one scene where he does some martial arts and then they tie him to a tank and drive him away and he's never seen again so it's like it, it's so bullshit like these studios when they're like oh we're gonna put a chinese actor in this movie and so we can make a bunch of money in china and they literally give that actor nothing to do um they're just like oh see we put him in one fight scene with miliovich isn't that cool isn't that what you paid for it just it's it's thinking so less of people and and that's what I hate the most about. I'm like, I'm sure people in China would have liked to seen that guy play an actual character with some actual lines of dialogue that mattered and he furthered the plot in some way, but he, he wasn't, he was just there. So that way you can, you know, try to capitalize on them. And I understand movies are a business and that they're going to take shortcuts and lazy ways to try to make their money back. But for me, like it, it's, that's, I hate when studios do that little, like it, when it's that pathetic. So anyway, I don't know if I'm going to talk through the whole credits. So obviously the cast part is actually coming up now where it lists Alice and Isaacs, Claire, Wesker, all of them, Doc, Razor, Abigail, all these characters that aren't from the movie or the games at all. Um, and uh, I think right there, I don't even know if we saw Olivia's name. I mean, we might've, I might've missed it, but um, 
yeah, and then this is all the they they thank all the people that were in past movies because they used their you know at the beginning they did that montage with scenes from every movie and that was their way of getting all the actors back for one more uh so they are dedicated to the memory of ricardo cornelius he is the gentleman who was killed while filming this movie and i'm i'm i mean i'm glad they put it in there i'm not saying everyone that worked in this movie is a a, a piece of shit who didn't care about the people that got hurt or the lives that were lost i'm not saying that at all but what I'm saying is that like Olivia Jackson, who was injured making this movie, she, she, you know, reached out for help, complained. She even complained on the day she worked on Mad Max movies, uh, like Fury Road. She was, I think she was a stunt double for, um, Charlize Theron in that movie. So she's done stunt work before and, uh, and has done a good job at it. And so that's why they hired her for this movie. I think she was in between making this movie and Wonder Woman. So, um... So she's had she's had a good career for this stuff, and uh, has done a great job on a lot of movies. So it's just um, it's a shame that someone with that level of professionalism, when she says, "Hey, I don't think this is safe," that they don't listen to her, and that they didn't factor that in. And of course, I wasn't there. I don't know everything that happened, but I know her testimony and her statements, and I I know that she tried to go to the studio and ask for help, and they kind of ignored her and they try to pay her off or, or offer her something, but it wasn't like a, enough or a, a, it wasn't a lot. And it didn't seem like there was a lot of, um, you know, when you're in an incident like that, there it's, it's of two things, right? Like one, your life is changed. She, it's going to be very hard to find stunt work for her to do certain things from now on. So her life has changed. And so obviously the studio is like, well, let's compensate her. But in some instances, depending on the person, they they don't just want that, or sometimes they don't even want that at all, or sometimes they want that and something heartfelt, something that says like I'm sorry this happened, uh, you know, so, like a real apology of some kind, or you know, I don't know, like I, I I guess it's hard to say because I'm not in anyone's shoes, but sometimes it's more than just about money, or sometimes it's about money and something else, and sometimes it's not about anything but money. But it sounds like Olivia just wanted someone to treat her like a human and treat her her situation with like some gravity uh, because obviously her life changed and none of theirs did. So she just wanted some level of empathy there and she wasn't getting it. And that's why she pushed further and harder and made it more public than she probably would have if there was just any type of heartfelt reach out or empathy, you know, towards her. Um, at least that's what it seemed like from my point of view, just following the story. But then Ricardo, you know, dying while filming this, like, I mean, just heartbreaking things for stunts that shouldn't even really be in a Resident Evil movie. Um, them driving like a giant, you know, Jeep thing right at a camera to do these like crazy stunts with this giant bat creature chasing it. It's like, no, I know that that's kind of in Resident Evil 5. There was a scene similar to that. But that's what I mean by Paul Anderson. I feel like sometimes he just watches a couple cutscenes and goes, let's do that in our movie. And he's not thinking that in a game, it's okay to do that because there's not actual stunt people's lives at risk there. No one's actually going to get hurt when they're doing a you know motion capture for the characters and they just you know build the whole game off of that motion capture where there's not an actual Jeep and there's not an actual anything you know chasing them. There's not a chance for them to drive into a camera or into a wall. And I think he just sees these things and goes, we can do that with, you know, with technology nowadays. And, and he's just like a giant kid who um, doesn't seem like he acts too responsible when it comes to that stuff. And that's also on his second unit team. Like, I don't think Paul Anderson shot that scene, to be fair to him. My criticism towards him is more because Olivia said she reached out to him and Jeremy Bolt, hoping to get some kind of help in some way. And they try to give her some money under the table and brush it under the rug, basically, is from what of what it seemed like. So that's why she made a she made it more public than than she probably originally was gonna. So when I heard her say that about Paul Anderson and Jeremy Bolt, I became less fans of them. Because when I watched them on the first movie, I'm like, all right, I'm not I don't love this movie. I don't hate it, but they clearly are excited to make Resident Evil, and that's that's great. I, I'm as a fan, I appreciate that. Even if I don't like the movies, I'm glad that they're excited to make it. But over time, I don't think they were. I wouldn't say they had that level of excitement after the third movie, you know, because they were only 
writers and producers of the first three movies. And then Paul Anderson wrote the wrote and directed the first one. But he came back as the writer and director of four, five, and six. And those are the ones that had the most accidents and tragedies on them. So to me, it, it, it's a shit show. And uh, I lost a lot of respect for the people that make these movies. So hopefully nothing like that happens again on any other movie, but on any of these new Resident Evil movies either. And I'm looking forward to seeing what Johannes Roberts does and I will be going to see that movie. This is probably going to drop on the Tuesday or so that I go see the movie. So I'll try to have my review up in the next day or two. Uh, Non-spoiler as my first review and then a spoiler review for my second one. I'll try to put that up over the weekend to give more of you time to see it around Thanksgiving. So um, thank you for watching this commentary. I stayed till the end of the credits. And uh, and I have nothing else to say about this movie. It's it's definitely the worst Res Evil movie ever, in my opinion. And, uh, and I'm sorry that people died and got severely injured to make it because I feel like most of the scenes in this movie that causes injuries didn't need to be in this movie. If this was a scary movie set in a mansion or a police department or anything like that, like the games were, it would have, uh, reduced the chances of something like those incidents happening. But because they had to do all these big, stupid, over the top, dumb bullshit that shouldn't have been in these movies, you know, I feel like that's part of the reason why we have the outcome we have part of it uh, the other part is that they did make this movie the way they wanted to but professionals weren't there to make sure people didn't get hurt uh, they had people there haphazardly coming up with changes to stunts on the last second and that's very unsafe so don't do that if you work on movies don't do that rehearse things a dozen times to the point where it's boring to do so that way you re reduce greatly your chance of getting hurt doing it that's all for me. Thank you so much for watching this episode. I really do appreciate it. And if you have any thoughts, if you made it this far, you know, got through all my bitching and stuff, let me know your thoughts of this movie down below. And as always, we'll continue the conversation down there. Thanks for watching the show. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And I literally will see you in Raccoon City when the new movie comes out. Peace.